thought, I thought you guys would appreciate that uh, being from Franklin County. I got at least got one thumbs up of a uh, little, little bluegrass music start out. How else would we start out a vision series for Bedrock Church Franklin County other than with a little bit of bluegrass music, right? Um, so uh, this morning we get the great opportunity to talk about what is coming up next year. What is what has God laid on our hearts as an elder team? Um, what has God laid on our hearts um, just as, as trying to follow after him, just to yearn after what he would call us to be as a community of believers here in Franklin County and the places that he wants us to go. And so, um, we, like, like I said earlier, we are, we're really excited. Um, so the plan this morning, um, as they often go, don't always turn out that way. The plan this morning was that uh, myself and Ross and Sam would each share a part of that. And uh, you guys can be praying for Sam. He's not feeling great this morning. So uh, I'm going to jump in and kind of cover his part. And so it sounds like this is kind of new to me. Um, um, it is because it's kind of new to me, um, but I think, I think we're going to be good. Um, and so um, we're going to talk about three different areas of, of how we feel like God is calling us to go and to, and to share the gospel um, with our community, right? Because we know that that's our mission, right, is to bring rescue and restoration to Franklin County by the gospel of Jesus. But we also have a vision statement, and this is what we want to be about, Right? This, is, this is the vision that as a church, as people in the community see us, this is what they would see. That we are to be disciples that are then making disciples and that, that are then changing the world. And so how are we going to accomplish that? And so that's kind of where we want to dive in this morning. And as we were talking about this and we were discussing it, we realized that the conclusion to Mark's gospel really hits on this idea of, of, of this vision of how we can be disciples, how we can make disciples, and how we can change the world. And so that's going to be kind of our jumping off point this morning is, uh, is the last few, ch- few verses in the Gospel of Mark. Now, if you turn in your Bibles to Mark 16 and you read verse 8, right? Um, after verse 8, got something going on weird there with our screen. Clear the background there. Okay, we'll roll with it. Um, hopefully you got your Bibles, you can read that. Um, but as, if you get to Mark chapter 8, uh, chapter 16, verse 8, at the very end of that, you'll see a note in here that says, Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include verses 9 through 20. And so when you see that in your Bible, right, there's, there's someone wanting to get a message across to us. They're wanting us to see something and ask a question. And the question they're wanting to us to ask is, Okay, so, so what does that mean that it wasn't in the earliest manuscripts? And, and more importantly, is that a problem for us? Like, should that make us question our Bible, right? And, and I can say today that no, it should not cause any worry or doubt in our minds, okay? Now, what that means is that this passage was probably not in Mark's original manuscript. So as Mark is writing his gospel account down, and remember, Mark is just collecting accounts from other people. And so, and so these accounts, right, then are passed along, and, and then scribes and different people in the church community are writing those down. They're making copies of those, right, so they can share with other people. And so the very earliest copies that we have of those do not include this last section, Okay, And so it probably wasn't what Mark originally penned. Now, is this a problem for the Bible? And again, I'm going to say the answer is no. This was most likely added by a scribe, possibly as early as the first or second century. So right in that same time, people who were still around, who probably heard the stories of Jesus, who probably saw Jesus do the things, there was a scribe who thought that the, the, the ending of Mark's original ending was probably uh, a little too... Um, ended a little too abruptly, as we talked about, right? Because Mark ends his gospel account by saying, so so Mary saw these angels, and they went out and they fled with fear and trembling, and they didn't tell anybody. And that's the end of what we have in verse 8. And so someone who was probably very well acquainted with Matthew's gospel account, right, who gives a little bit further picture, probably felt that this needed to be added in there, okay? And so they, they added this concluding little section into the end of that um, to kind of finish out the story. And as we're going to look at in a little bit, um, what is included here in verses 9 through 16 is very parallel, it's very similar to what we find in Matthew 28 as Matthew ends his gospel account, okay? And so a couple things to, to realize. 
Um, one is that it does not include any teachings that are not found in other places in the scriptures or in the gospels. So it's not like we get something that just gets this far out teaching that's not taught anywhere else. It, it is confirmed in other places in the gospel um, and in, in, the, in the New Testament. Secondly, it was passed down by the church fathers, and it was also included in the canon. And so when they decided to canonize the scriptures, when they collected all of the different letters, and they composed them together in what we call our Bible, right? The early church fathers, as they looked at that, they included this section in Mark. And so it's an interesting fact that this may not have been in the original text, but it should not discolor our understanding of the reliability of of scripture. Furthermore, and this is what I hang on to, is that God and his sovereignty saw it fit that these verses be passed along and included in what we have today as our Bible. And so we can know that these are reliable, that these verses are trustworthy, that we can read these, and that we don't have to fear that this is something outside of what happened. Uh, it's another account trying to lead people astray, right? Um, because of all of those reasons. And as I said earlier, it mirrors very much so what we find in Matthew. So I'm just going to read Mark 16, 9 through 20. <clears throat> and here's what it says. It says, now when he, uh, now when he, ro- uh, I'm sorry, let me try that again. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he cast out seven demons. And she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had not seen had not been seen by her, they would not and had been seen by her, they would not believe her. After these things, he appeared to another in another form to two of them, as they were walking into the country, and they went back and told the rest. But they did not believe them. <clears throat> and afterwards he appeared to the eleven um, themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. <clears throat> because they had not believed those who had saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink deadly poison it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he spoke them, spoke this to them, was taken up into heaven and set at the right hand of God. And they went out preaching everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Okay? So um, what Mark says here, what's included in this last part of Mark right, is also something that, that Matthew includes in his gospel. And this is really where we want to focus in on, is we want to focus in today on verses 15 and 16, where, he said, where Jesus tells his disciples, uh, or what's been come, what has been known as the Great Commission, right, to go into all the world and to proclaim the gospel to all of creation, so that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned, okay? Matthew says it this way in his gospel. This is in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. He says, And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This mission that Jesus gives for his disciples, kind of Jesus' last commissioning before he ascends into heaven, he leaves his disciples with a message. And that message is that you need to go and you need to tell the story, right? You need to tell the story of Jesus to everyone you come in contact with, right? And each gospel writer kind of shares this in a different way, but the consistent message is that we are to go and to tell the story, And that's really what we want to talk about this morning is how can we as a church community tell the story? How can we tell the story in such a way that other people would come to know Jesus? That other people in our community would come to hear the hope and the love that each one of us have found in our relationship with Jesus? How can we go and to tell the story? 
And so today we're going to look at three different ways that we can go and tell the story. And the story, as, as, as is included there in Mark, is the good news. It's the gospel. It's the news of what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to die on a cross for our sins so that we no longer had to pay for our sins, but that he did that in our place. Right? That's the good news. Okay? And so today we're going to look at three different ways that we tell that good news, that we tell the story. And so beginning in Mark 16, verse 15, right? The first way we're going to do that is by showing the story. The first way we tell the story is that we show the story. Look what he says in verse 16, uh, verse 15. He says, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel, right? Jesus' words were very intentional, that he wanted his disciples to go into all of the world, Right? There's this emphasis on the action of going, right? So why is going the first part of Jesus' command? Well, if you know the story of the Bible, if you know the story of God, you know that God is a God of going. Think about this for just a second. When everything started back in the very beginning in Genesis, God created the perfect world, made, made a perfect world for the first two humans, Adam and Eve, and then Adam and Eve decided to break that relationship with God, right? By this thing that, call, that we call sin came into the world. And they decided they weren't going to trust God anymore. They were going to kind of do it on their own. And so they, they break God's command and they break that relationship with God. But then what is the very next thing that happens in the story? Do you guys remember? God comes to them, doesn't he? It's Adam and Eve don't go to God and repent that they were wrong. God comes to them. God comes to find them even in the midst of their sin. God comes to them. And what does he do? You guys remember that? He kills an animal to make a covering, to cover their shame of what they've done. Okay? Fast forward the story a little bit further. We get introduced to a guy named Abraham. And the Bible tells us there was nothing special about Abraham, right? But there was this guy named Abraham. And what does God do? God goes to Abraham to establish a covenant with him. And then a little bit later, he goes back with a couple of angels to confirm the promise that God made to Abraham. So we keep going in the story. There's another guy named Jacob. And God has this moment, this encounter, where God goes to Jacob in a dream and wrestles with him. And this is where Jacob's name is changed. And then, of course, we can't forget about Moses and how God comes to Moses in this burning bush moment before he calls him to do this incredible thing. Again and again in the story, we see that God shows up as he, as he comes to his people, all right? But finally, in the greatest picture of this is something that we just celebrated in the story of Jesus, God coming to humanity in human form, Emmanuel, God with us. So the point is this, Even when we don't seek God, he still seeks us. And aren't we grateful for that? Right? We think about your own story, right? Think about your own story. I don't, I've not met too many people who were just like, I was just looking for God. I realized that I was a horrible person and I was looking for God. Most of us, our story was, I didn't even realize how broken I was till God showed up, till God opened my eyes, right? And we see this throughout that we serve a God who goes, right? And we look at the life of Jesus as we did over this past year. We see that Jesus consistently goes to people in need. (coughs) In Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, we read this back at the beginning of last year. As Jesus begins his ministry, notice the words that Mark used to describe what he did. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. The first step that Jesus made in his ministry was to go. He came to people to share the gospel. And so it should not surprise us that the first step of Jesus in going is the last command that he leaves with his disciples. That we are to go. And Jesus wants us to follow his example, right? We, we all knew the story of Jesus when he calls his disciples, 
right? He calls a group of fishermen and tax collectors and zealots and common people. And what does he tell them to do? He says, come follow me so that then I can send you out to go to other people. Jesus was continually calling people to go, right? He was calling people to go. But the problem, though, with going is that for many of us, we have really good excuses of why we shouldn't go, don't we? In fact, I would go so far to say that for most of us, and I put myself in that category, right, that probably most of the time we spend more of our energy and effort focusing on why we can't go than thinking about ways to make a way to go, right? Like maybe we feel God laying on our hearts that we need to go and have a conversation with somebody, or maybe we feel like God has, has laid a burden on our heart in our community of something that needs to be fixed. And if you're anything like me, I spend the majority of my time coming up with reasons why I shouldn't go, then taking that time and focusing on why I should go, or thinking about how I can make a way to go. It reminds me of a story that I heard of this, uh, this past couple of weeks about a young man who was eager to grow in his Christian life. He was excited Right? He was one of those, like, if you've ever had one of those church camp experiences and you come home, right, and you're just like on a spiritual high and you're just ready to like, you know, share the gospel with everybody in Walmart. Any, any of you guys ever been there in that moment, right? And you're just on fire and you're just eager and you're like, Lord, wherever you want me to go, just send me, right? And so this young man, he got a piece of paper and he decided that he was going to write down a list of things that he was willing to do for God. And he made this list of things, and he showed up to church the next Sunday, and he went and he put that list on the altar. And yet, as he left that list on the altar, he walked away feeling empty inside. And so he decided to, to take that list back, and he went back home, and, and he started thinking about some more things that he could do, some more things that he could give up, some more things that he could do to, 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 to honor God. And so he, he made a longer list, and he added more things to the list. And he goes back the next Sunday, and he puts it on the altar, and again, he just feels empty. And then he goes and he, he meets with a, a wise, older pastor. And he tells the pastor what the problem is that he's having. He said, like, I'm making this list. I'm telling God everything I'm willing to do for him. And yet I feel so empty inside. And the pastor sets and thinks for a minute. And he says, why don't you do this? He said, why don't you get a blank piece of paper and you sign your name at the bottom of it. And you leave that blank piece of paper on the, on the altar. And so the next Sunday, that's exactly what this young man does. He takes a blank piece of paper, he signs his name on it at the bottom, and he puts it on the altar. And in this moment, a peace comes into his heart that he hasn't experienced, because that's exactly what God wants for us. God doesn't want us to come to him with our list of things that we're wanting to do for him, even though that's great and ambitious. God wants us to be obedient and open to whatever it is that he's calling us to do. Around the Bedrock Network, we have this phrase that we use for this kind of moment of surrender. We, we call it putting your yes on the table, right? And what it looks like to put your yes on the table means that I put my yes on the table. And whatever it is that God's calling me to do, I've already given it a yes. And I can't take it back because I've already given God my yes. And I think that's the heart that Jesus has here as he's sharing these last commissioning words for his disciples. To go to go. And Jesus knows the places that he's going to send them are not always wonderful places. In fact, uh, from what history tells us, all of his disciples, except for maybe one of them, ended up dying for their faith. It wasn't an easy task that Jesus called them to go, but yet he still called them to go. And you see, I want to be a person who goes and shares the story I want to go and share the story because I know that Jesus came to show the world the story. And so in the same way, I want to go and I want to share that story. And so how can we do that? How can we do that? There are three areas at and among bedrock this year that we want to focus on going. Okay, And we want to start at home and we want to kind of branch our way out which is kind of a, a biblical model of how we see the gospel going out. It started in Jerusalem, and then it went out to the surrounding areas and going out from there. So and the first way we can do this, very practically, is to serve one another, right? 
And I know what's probably going through some of your minds. Well, that doesn't seem very glamorous. That doesn't seem very big in, in God's parameter, like, like serving somebody. So you're telling me that I go and help somebody in, in my church? Like that's, yes, that's where it get, can start, right? That's one of the things that I love about having a gathering time on Sunday mornings is it gives us an opportunity to connect with people in our church community, and hopefully to hear needs of people that are happening that God may want to be using you to do. So we can serve one another. Secondly, we can serve our community. And we have some intentional ways to do that, but there may be some other ways that God lays on your heart over the next year. A few of those intentional ways is is a partnership that we have with Stepping Stones Ministry, which is our local soup kitchen. Bedrock Church has taken the fourth Wednesday of every month to go in to serve at the soup kitchen. And I'll just be honest with you this morning. I think if we got what Jesus is saying in this moment, that we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be struggling to get volunteers to come and serve. We would have to make a waiting list for people to serve. Because this is one of the most practical ways, church, that we can go and share the story. It's just by serving a hot meal to people. We just get to go and be in people's lives. It's incredible. Another opportunity we have to, to meet needs in this community is to is through our care portal ministry. A care portal, if you're not familiar, is just a connection between churches and social services, families in need in our community. And care portal is a bridge that allows us to connect with those families. And it gives us opportunities to meet those needs. And so if you haven't already, I would encourage you, if you go to our website, bedrockfc.com slash next steps, there's a link on our next steps page that you can sign up to get all the messages of the needs that are coming in through Care Portal. And those things vary, right? Over the last year and a half of us doing Care Portal, we've seen everything from um, needs for uh, helping people with transportation. There's some financial needs. We've, uh, there's been lots of needs of just things as simple as diapers and just a few supplies that, that people need, all the way up to major renovation and, and construction work that we've been able to be a part of. But it's a great bridge for us to be able to go and get involved in people's lives. <coughs> and then as we are out in the community, right, hopefully this year we're going to be able to engage again more in our community with things like um, like the, um, like the Easter egg hunt that our community does and different community events that we get to be a part and just connect with people. In fact, there are people here this morning that are here this morning because like four or five years ago, we showed up to an Easter egg hunt and we blew up some balloons and we talked to people, right? <laughs> they even raised their hands, right? Um, like those things matter and they're opportunities for us to connect in our community, But then also, it doesn't just stop in our community, but it needs to go out across our nation and across our world. And we have opportunities to support missions, right? We have opportunities to support some missionaries this year, right? We're being very intentional. We're supporting missionaries in Nicaragua. We're supporting missionaries that are going to the northern caucus and areas over in that area that that are engaging in ministry there. And then we're also engaging with missionaries that are going, uh, planning to go to Jordan and to engage in uh, the Middle East ministry and areas over there. And so we have opportunities to support them. Um, one of the really cool things, so we got a new missionary couple, um, and we'll introduce you guys to them more. I'm hoping that they'll be actually be able to come one Sunday and, and you'll get to hang out with them. Um, but we have a new couple who are going to be joining, uh, we're going to start supporting this year. Um, and their name is Joshua and Taylor, and they're going to Jordan, and the plan is for them this summer is that they're going to go to Jordan. And so they're in the early parts of trying to get their funding together, get their plan together, get their team to go over and to serve over in this other part of the world. And so we could be a part of that. There's some needs that they're going to have coming up over the next six months to be able to get them onto the mission field, and we can be a part of that. We can be a part. We can be praying for them. We can be engaging with them. There's possibilities for us even this year. We've been talking with our church planner who's planning up in uh, Philadelphia about the possibility this summer maybe of getting a trip to go up to Philadelphia and to serve alongside another church plant and just to love on them and to serve people in a different community. And so I would just encourage you guys to get on board. Now here's the crazy thing is we kind of bring this full circle, okay? So you bring this around for full circle. Here's, here's the crazy thing. You remember a few minutes ago I listed out all those people that God get, came to? So we had like Abraham and Jacob and Moses. 
The ending of the story wasn't just that God came to them, right? He came to them, but then he also called them to go. So Abraham, he, cal- he came to Abraham, he made a promise to Abraham, but then he also called Abraham to go into a foreign land to follow him. Jacob, he called Jacob to go back to his homeland and even back to his brother who was threatening his life. And then of Moses, of course we can't forget about Moses, he called him to go back to Egypt to free his people. You see, whenever God calls us, whenever God comes to us, he also comes to us to call us to go somewhere else. And that's exactly what Jesus calls us to do. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a few minutes together um, and, and let's just talk about our perspective on going, on going, okay? And so here's the question we're going to talk about for a few minutes. What excuses do we make or reasons we make that we can't go or serve, right? Let's just be really honest, right? This is not a place of judgment or condemning anybody for the reasons, right? Because we all have them. It's just a good place to start talking about what are some of those obstacles that get in the way that make it challenging for us to be able to go? And then how can we turn those excuses into reasons to go and to show the story? So what are some things that we can do to allow us to be able then to go and to share the story? So let's take a few minutes and talk about that. And then when we come back together, we're going to talk about the the second part of uh, how we tell the story. Proclaim the gospel to the whole of creation. In Matthew's account of the Great Commission, the author uses a different word. Uh, He uses the word teaching instead of proclaim, but they have similar ideas. Uh, Proclaiming or preaching is meant for non-believers, whereas teaching is meant for people who already follow Jesus. So either way, the words of Jesus are meant to be spoken and told to other people. So we are called to share the story. In order to do that, we need to know what the story actually is, right? We spent all year learning about the words of Jesus. um, But Paul also warns Timothy in a letter uh, and to us that we need to both give and receive good teaching based in the word or we're liable to follow whatever teaching is easiest or whatever version of the teaching we think our culture will accept. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 to 4, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Man, we see that today as well, right? That people follow whatever is easiest, and so we need to know the word so that we can share the word with other people. At Bedrock, the proclaiming or the teaching of the word mostly takes place in our larger gatherings on Sundays. Um, On Sunday mornings, the elders, uh, Sam, Rust, and myself, introduce the word and different teachings from Scripture. Our method is called expositional, uh, meaning that we expose what is in the text. So we always start with Scripture. We start with the text as the foundation of what we are teaching from. In order to be good and faithful stewards of the text, uh, we spend time in preparation. We meet together Tuesday evenings, the three of us, and we review each other's sermons and provide insights and ideas and wisdom um, uh, to make this scripture more clear. Uh, And we're not perfect by any means, so we need that accountability and we benefit from the wisdom of each other as we seek to uh, expose the, the words of Jesus. This year, we are excited to be seeking truth by going through some different books this year. So we are going to flash those on the screen quickly. Sorry, Aaron. So we are going to be going through this year uh, the book of Titus, uh, the book of Jonah, the book of Proverbs, and the book of 1 John. And our hope is that as we seek truth and wisdom from Scripture this year, that it will lead to transformation in our lives and how we help other people. Uh, as you guys know, we also want to learn from each other as we are teaching as well. And so our Sunday morning time, um, we rotate. Uh, so it's not the same person uh, speaking every Sunday. That as elders, we are able to be poured into as well. Um, 
so we rotate whoever's speaking. Uh, and we believe in opportunities not just to learn from each other, but from the rest of the body through our group discussions throughout the message as well. Uh, at the end of teaching time, we want to encourage everyone to engage in practical takeaways. That's something we've talked about that as we are looking forward this year, that is something we want to emphasize, um, that we are going to be challenging everyone with more specific ways to take home and practice what we are learning about each week, and then follow up on that each Sunday as well. We also know that learning from Scripture uh, doesn't end at 11.30 on Sunday mornings, or later, depending on who's speaking. Um, but we will be uh, providing a new Bible reading plan this year, so that throughout your week you are learning from Scripture as well. And this year we are going through just the New Testament. So we really enjoyed being able to go through the Bible in a year, but we know that some of us found that difficult to stay on pace. It was three or four chapters each day. So this year we are just doing the New Testament uh, so that is a little bit more manageable, uh, as Russin said, and is going to be really great to be able to meditate more deeply uh, on the story of Jesus and the power of his words. This upcoming year as well, we are thinking about how to better make disciples. We realize that there is an unreached people group in our own congregation, uh, and that is our kids, that we love our model of multi-generational church that we all get to be together, but we want to be more intentional this year of discipling our children uh, of the church so that they can also share the story of Jesus. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so during our discussion times this upcoming year, um, during the message, we will be having discussion questions specifically for kids in the church. So you'll see there'll be discussion question and then kids discussion question. Um, and we're hoping we can encourage, uh, or maybe in a rotation, having kids discussion groups uh, to facilitate that, uh, to continue those conversations throughout the service as well. Um, we also will be creating questions to take home as well, so we'll have those out uh, hopefully next week, uh, to then take home and continue the discussion with your family uh, and you know, figuring out what they learned during the message, what uh, stuck, what was the takeaway. We know that uh, discipling children as well can be new and difficult uh, for some of us uh, that don't have experience with that. And so we're going to be providing opportunities for encouragement and resources of how to help with that, how to answer those difficult questions, how to, when your kids have those kind of uh, hard questions that they want to ask. We also know that discipling children is not a job limited to parents, that we are all called to disciple. Um, and if we're putting a limit on who we are willing to disciple, um, that our yes isn't fully on the table. And so I know this is something for me as well that... Um, I've been convicted of that, uh, being willing to disciple anybody. And so uh, we see this idea uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 6 uh, and verse 6 and 7. It says, And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. So discipling is a lifelong process. Right? It's not just on Sunday morning uh, or when it's convenient. Right? It's a process we are all called to be part of. And so this year we will be hosting a few seminars um, of how to disciple children for those that are parents and those that aren't because we are all called to be part of this um, to help raise up the next generation. So we'll be having uh, a couple seminars throughout the year of trainings about how to disciple different age groups from little ones to teenagers as well as different topics of how to help kids that have been in trauma or how to talk to teens about uh, difficult issues uh, of our day. And so that's our goal. Uh, part of our vision this year is to be more intentional with our teaching and how we are discipling everybody in the church. So let's talk about it a little bit. We're going to have a discussion question. Uh, what are some opportunities that you have to teach others or to share the story of Jesus? Right? Teaching just doesn't happen on Sunday or in a classroom. Uh, and so where could you pursue more opportunities to teach others about Jesus? Let's talk about that in our discussion groups.
Peter. I don't know who he was referencing to. It must have been Sam. I'm blaming on him because he's not here this morning. Um, just kidding. So he gave me uh, about 10 minutes to finish this last part. So we'll see if we can, we can get through that. All right, so we've talked about um, how we tell the story, right? So we've talked about um, this, this idea of um, going and showing the story. We, we've talked about sharing the story, right? And then on this last sec- section today, we're going to talk about the third way that we can um, tell the story is by living out the story, by living out the story. And so um, that's where we're going to uh, take the last little bit of our time together and talk about this. And this is, um, as we look at Mark 16, 16, this is where Jesus tells his disciples, once you go out and proclaim that to the whole world, right? Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Whoever believes and is baptized. You see, the goal of this process of believing in baptism, right, is not just to say that you're a Christian and kind of uh, have no change in your life, but it, the goal is this process of becoming a disciple, right? Jesus never uses the phrase believer, but he uses the phrase disciple over and over again to describe those who are following him. J.D. Greer, uh, in his book, Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart, makes this uh, great observation. He says this, he says, Christ did not come to make Christians, he came to make disciples. Discipleship is not one of the church's various ministries. It's not something that the paid staff do. Discipleship is who we are. As the church, who we are at the very core. It's a more biblical approach to evangelism. You see, discipleship is not something that we do. It's who we are. It's the process in which we become more and more like Jesus. Jesus uses the word disciple. In the Greek, that's the word mathetes, right? But the Hebrew word for the same idea, this was not something new to Jesus, right? The Hebrew word was talmudim. It's this idea of being a learner or a follower, an apprentice, one who follows after their rabbi. Or you could put it another way, to understand what a disciple does, the goal of discipleship is threefold. It's to be with your rabbi, to become like your rabbi, and to do what your rabbi did. And so for us as followers of Jesus, the goal then for us as we are becoming disciples of Jesus is to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus the more time we spend with him, and to do the things that Jesus did. There was an ancient blessing that would be pronounced over disciples, right, that I think embodied this idea. And the blessing went something like this, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. This idea that you are following so closely to your rabbi. Now, I found this, uh, I guess a church did this. Um, and then so I, when I was looking for this idea of, of following the dust of your rabbi, I found some church made this up and I thought it was really funny. Eat dust. That's an easier way to say it, right? Eat dust. But the idea is that I would follow my rabbi so closely, that we would follow Jesus so closely that the dust from his feet as he is walking would cover us. We would be covered in his presence. Discipleship, much like learning a new language, is best done through immersing ourselves into it, right? If you've ever tried to learn a second language, uh, another language, right, you know the absolute best way to learn another language is to immerse yourself into that, to put yourself into a culture where they only speak that language, and you kind of force yourself to learn that language. And the same is true when it comes to discipleship, right? Many of us, many people in the church have been following Jesus for years and yet they look the same. They don't look any more like Jesus than when they first began. And I think the reason is because we kind of take a hands-off approach, right? Like I'm going to say a prayer. I'm going to like maybe believe a few things up here in my head, but that's about as far as it goes. If we truly want to be disciples of Jesus, if we truly want to look like Jesus this next year and become like Jesus in this next year and be able to do the things that Jesus did, we must immerse ourselves in Jesus. 
I think that idea of baptism, right, is such a beautiful picture of that, right? It's the idea of being immersed as you, as you go down into the water. You're representing being immersed into Christ, into dying to your old self. And as you're raised out of the water, it's this picture of new life. This idea of discipleship. And discipleship is a process or a cycle. It's not a one-time event. It's not a class that you take, th- you take and then you get an award and now you're a disciple of Jesus. It's a lifelong process. And it's a cycle. The beautiful thing about discipleship is that it's a, it's a cycle. And so first you hear the gospel. That's the first step in discipleship. Right? And then over the course you continue to grow in your understanding of the gospel and who Jesus is. And then you share the gospel. And that process then starts all over for the next person. And it repeats over and over and over again. So how do we do that here at Bedrock, right? The way in which we create disciples, that we become disciples first at Bedrock is through our life groups, right? The way that we practically become disciples is through our life groups, right? In fact, we've said this many times over the years as we began. If you had to pick just one thing to do to be a part of at Bedrock, as much as we love our Sunday morning gatherings, as much as we love our serving environments, we would encourage you, if you could only have time to do one thing throughout the week, it would be a part of a life group. Because in a life group, there's going to be that intentional discipleship time for you to grow and to serve and to become more like Jesus. Now, we hope that's not the only thing that you have the opportunity to do throughout your week. But if we had to pick just one of those, we would say do life groups, right? Because there's something about getting in a smaller group of people. Listen, I love our Sunday morning time together. And every week I have this same thing go through my mind. I have this idea that, man, I want to talk to this person this week, and I want to talk to this person this week. And I don't just want to talk to people, if you know me. Like, I want to go deep with people, which is probably why I always make us late on Sunday mornings, right? I can't just say things in one sentence. I need to say them in like 15 right? And so I want to have a long extended conversation. I want to know how people's week was. I want to know what's going on in their lives. I want to dive in deep and see what's happening. But the reality is that on Sunday mornings, those things never happen. And I've had to come to that realization, right? There's lots of people that I need to have conversations with. There's also set up and tear down that needs to happen. And typically there's always a kid of mine somewhere that needs something from daddy, even on a Sunday morning, right? And so Sunday mornings are great, to check in and to casually kind of catch up with people. But it's not the best environment to go deep. That's what our life groups are for. It's a place for us to go deep. And so uh, I just want to talk for a few minutes that we have remaining about life groups, okay? And this year, I'm really excited that we're going to refocus our energy and our efforts on life groups and being intentional in those groups. I'll be the first one to admit, 2020 was a blow, to a lot of things, right? And one of those personal areas that we felt like it hit the hardest was in our life groups, right? We weren't able to meet for a season, then we could meet, and then we couldn't meet again, and then this and that. And, and I think just corporately, we've kind of gotten to this idea of like, you know, like, um, I don't know, we just feel like it's, it's really hard to, to commit to something. And so there hasn't been a whole lot of consistency, um, a lot of different things. And then we were just like, man, let's just try to meet together. Um, but we're refocusing this year on our life groups. This is where, as an elder team, that we've come together and said, we want to dump a majority of our energy this year into focusing on these life groups, into focusing on these communities where people can get together and they can learn and they can grow together, right? Because in the church world, there's kind of two ideas of what you can do with life groups. There is on one side, what they would say is a church with life groups, okay? And this is kind of like a cafeteria model, right? You come up to the line and you just kind of pick what you want. Oh, this life group works great for me. I I love it. I'll take a side of this and a side of that. And you know what? If I can't do it today, it's okay. Like, it's not that big of a deal, right? Because there's tons of options of things. On the other side, you have church, uh, the church of life groups. And this is more like you go to a restaurant and there's a special and that's the only thing that's offered, right? And so you sit down, and this is the only offering, and this is the direction that I want us to move in as a church, that we want to move in as a church. Life groups doesn't just become another thing that I add to my list of following Jesus, but it's part of the way that I actually become a better follower of Jesus. 
And so if that means that we need to push other things aside so that we can make this thing happen and happen more intentionally, that's what we're willing to do. And so we want to focus in on our life groups. Now, what are life groups? If you've been around at Bedrock any time, you probably know, but I just thought it would be helpful to clarify. The word life in life group is actually an acrostic. It stands for something. I didn't create it, but someone way smarter than me created it. And so here's what it stands for. It's the four different aspects of our life group. The L is for learning. Learning. Life groups should be a time that we come together and that we study God's word. You see, the Bible was intended to be studied in community. Think about this for just a second. I was challenged by this a few weeks ago, right? Up until the last, say, 500 years, how did people study the Bible? Think about it. They didn't study it individually like we do today. Why? Because they didn't have one, right? It wasn't until about the last 500 years that we, people actually had their own copies of the Bible. From all of Christianity past, they studied it communally. They studied it together. They would go to a synagogue. They would go to a, to a, to a meeting, to a church together, because that's where they had a copy of God's Word, and they would study it together. And there's such beauty in coming together and studying there's a perspective that other people have when you study through Scripture that can then enhance your own understanding of God's Word. So it's a learning environment. It's also an inspiring environment. It's a place that we come together and we should be encouraged and built up and inspired to follow Jesus more closely. One of the things that we're challenging our life groups to do this year is to take one of the weeks out of uh, their meeting and to intentionally focus on on prayer. And we're going to start putting together some prayer guides that you can be praying for our missionaries around the world, that you can be praying for some of the needs locally that are happening in our community, so that when we come together, one of the aspects of coming together as a life group is that we're praying together, right? And not the, not the church prayer meetings that some of us are familiar with, where you get together and talk for 45 minutes about all the things that are happening, and then you pray for five minutes, But like when we get together and we discuss for five minutes and we pray for 45 minutes for the things that are happening, okay? So they're inspiring, they're fellowshipping, that's the F. It's an opportunity to share life together, to share meals together, to be in community together. That word fellowship in the original Greek is the word koinonia, and it means that you hold something in common, right? Right? You hold something in common. And the only way I know how to have things in common with people is actually by spending time with them. And so it's okay on a life group night sometimes just to hang out with your other life group people and see what's happening in their life and get to know them and to start to have some commonality and even maybe even do some things from time to time outside of the designated time is okay. So it's a fellowshipping group. Then E, the last part, is equipping. Equipping. It should also be able to help us to follow Jesus better, more intimately, closely, right, to help us to grow in that. And so we are also um, challenging our life groups this year for one, for one week um, out of the four weeks they meet every month, for one of those weeks to have some in, intentional accountability time, some intentional discipleship time. So this can be a season where the guys are going to probably go in one space and the ladies are going to go in another space and it's a place just to kind of get real about things that are happening in life, Right? Because what we realize is that sometimes we're not as comfortable talking about some of those things in mixed company. And so this is also going to be an opportunity. Maybe we can challenge one another to to memorize scripture, to pray for some intentional needs and struggles that we're going through, and just some time to just be open and honest with some other believers that can help walk through that, some intentional discipleship time. And so uh, we're encouraging our life groups to adopt once a month to be able to have that kind of intentional focus time together. And so I can't encourage you enough to be a part of a life group over this next year. And here's the thing, just like everything else, life groups are broken sometimes, and there's going to be conflict, and there's going to be issues, and there's going to be struggles, and there's going to be challenges. Sometimes you're not going to like your life group leader, and that's okay, all right? Um, Sometimes you're going to get into a conflict or whatever, right? But it's so worth it. It's so worth it because this is the way we believe we can best grow and follow Jesus is in community together. Now, that's how we grow, right, together. But then we also grow kind of corporately. uh, The next step of how we can uh, become closer disciples of Jesus and make more disciples of Jesus is also by joining in the family of Jesus together. And so what I mean by that is we're talking about joining this local church. 
And I like to always use the illustration of a spectator versus a player, right? And so I love sports. Um, I love football. I love the NFL. Um, I love, my team is the Green Bay Packers, as many of you guys know. Um, I could tell you many stats about the Packers. Uh, my brother-in-law was in the room right now. I would throw it in his face that we're probably going to have the MVP this year again for two times in a row. Okay. Um, but here's the difference though, right? It's a very different experience for me to sit in my living room and watch the Packers play. And even if I'm cheering for them and got my cheese head on, and yes, I do have a cheese head, right? And I'm cheering for the Packers and I'm like, and, and I'm all in the game or whatever. That's a very different experience than if I was on the field in the pads and they were throwing the ball to me, right? It's a different experience. And that's kind of the experience that sometimes we have in church. Like, it's great for people to come and to be a part of church, and we always want our church to be open and welcoming for people, and we never want them to be pressured to join. But at a certain point, we need to get in the game. And the best way that we do that is by joining in, by covenanting together with this church that this is the place, this is the community of people that I'm going to join in with And we're going to do life together. We're going to do ministry together. We're going to love this community together well. And I'm going to be committed to you. And you're going to be committed to me. Right? And that's why we call it, that's why we use this family language. Because it's this idea of joining a family. And so when you join in with the family, right, you're part of it. And it's just like in all of our families, we have that weird uncle or whatever, you know, that's just kind of weird. But we still love them. Right? And maybe you're the weird uncle or maybe you're the cool cousin. Right? But we all have a part in the family. Right? And so we're inviting you to come and to be a part of that, to join in with our family. And so what does that process look like for us then for membership in the church? Uh, well, the first step is what we call family orientation. And it's a class where we get together and we just talk about what does it mean to be a part of Bedrock Church? What is our vision? What is our values? A lot of things we're talking about this morning, just talking about those, how you can plug in with those things, right? And so we have another, um, coming up on January 29th, we have our next family orientation class. And this is open for anybody. There's no commitment at this. This has just come to learn about what it means to be a part of the church. And so if you would like to be a part of that, uh, we actually have our registration open right now at our uh, bedrockfc.com slash next steps. And you can click on the link there and you can register to be a part of that. It's a two-hour class. We have child care. We'll provide breakfast for that time together. But it's just a time to come and hear about what the church is all about. And at the end of that class, you'll get a covenant. We'll go over a covenant. And this is, what, um, this is what it means to be a part of the church. And the covenant is two-sided. It's what we expect from our members. And then also what you as a member of the church can expect from your local church. Okay? And so you take that, that covenant home and you pray over it. And if you decide that you want to move forward, the next step in our process is called family discussion. It's a conversation where two, maybe three of the elders, we get together and we just talk about those things. Here's what it means to be a follower, uh, to, to be a part of this church. Here's what it means. Have you done this? Are you plugged in with a life group? How can we help you get to that place? And it's a conversation and that happens individually. It's not a, a class or anything like that. We just schedule that out and have a conversation. If you then decide after that conversation, yes, I'm all in, I'm ready to join in with this family, right? You sign the covenant. And then the last step is that we have a family celebration. We have a family celebration. This is a, 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 an excitement where we get to celebrate our new members. And we had one of those uh, last year. And we have another one coming up on January 16th. We've had some new people want to join and to, to sign the covenant and join the church. And so we want to celebrate that together. So what does it mean to be a part of this family? Just a few things really, really quickly. Okay? First of all, it means that as a family member, you have a voice in what happens in your family. Okay? And so um, about a week ago, we sent out some surveys to all of our current members asking about things th- various things throughout the church's ministry that we're doing. What are things we need to improve on? What are some areas? What are some things we need to think about? Right? Because we want our members to have a voice into how this church functions and grows. And we want to hear that voice. And we're going to use that information then as we make decisions throughout the year. Okay? And so family members have a voice, but they also have a responsibility. Just like many of you guys, everybody who grew up in a family, you know that being a part of a family, there's a responsibility. Right? And so as part of the family, right, we're going to all share in serving this community together. Right? But then the last part of that, the the, the beautiful picture is that, is that you also have ownership in the fruit of what happens. And so as we see people come to Christ 
in this community, as we see hungry people served in this community, as we see needs met through care portal and other things like that in the community, you, as a member of Bedrock Church, get to be a part of that. You share in that fruit because you, as a member, have joined in and you've made it possible for us as a church corporately to do those things. And that's the beautiful picture about joining the family. Okay, so we've talked about life groups. We've talked about membership. Now, finally, I want to land the plane this morning just by calling us back to what we started out by talking about, and that's telling the story, right? Here's the challenge that I want to leave with us today. Ross talked about one of the things that we want to do uh, practically this year is to have more practical challenges that we can walk, walk away and, and think about um, throughout our week. And so this week, here's the challenge. As we think about the story and telling the story, We also know a big part of telling the story is actually just opening up our mouths and sharing the good news, right? It's not complicated. It's just hard sometimes for us to do that, right? And so here's where we want to land the plane. I want to challenge us this year to come up with a list of 10 people that we're going to be intentional to tell the story with, okay? 10 people that we're going to tell the story with. So um, in your seats this morning, you should have found a big index card, Um, go ahead and grab those. If you need a pen, there are some pens on the back table. Um, I forgot to lay them out, but if you need a pen, there are some on the back table. Um, And I want to just give us a few minutes. This is not going to be group discussion time. This is just going to be like a couple of minutes of reflection for us to think about 10 people that we know that we're going to be intentional this year in sharing the gospel with, that we're going to be intentional in telling the story with. That That may be a friend that we're going to have dinner with, and we're going to intentionally get that conversation to Jesus. It could be a coworker, right? It could be it could be somebody in our family. It could be one of our kids. It could be it could be lots of different people. But ten people that you know this year that at some point in 2022 that we're going to tell the story. We're going to tell the hope of Jesus that He called us to do to go out and to proclaim the gospel to all of creation. Okay, we're going to find a way to do that this year. Okay, so let's take a couple minutes and talk about that together.